Hello and welcome to our latest virtual bridge session. And today we're tackling the thorny issue of really digital capability, digital skills, um, and what, what we imagined in the past would set us on a track to everybody being equipped to, to learn and to teach in the best way possible. And then we were interrupted by, by COVID. And it's just a look to see if all of our initial aspirations have held up over the last 18 months. And, and Walter, you are going to lead the charge on this investigation. So I will quickly <laughs> shut up and pass on to you and, and tell, us, um, tell us a bit more about this investigation into whether all those standards were really fit for purpose. Thanks, Kenji. Well, to be honest, I don't really see myself as leading the charge. I think I'm perhaps uh, following in the footsteps of others like uh, Jason, who's present in the call today, because it's a question I think that many people are, are addressing. And indeed, at the end of this, I will refer to the recently published, well, September 2020 publication from JISC that was looking at post-COVID futures for digital and further education. But I suppose the starting point is that um, we have had frameworks in place for some time for this, co this um, question of digital skills and digital capability. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so I hardly need to say to this audience what a, um, a disruption there was to further in higher education and indeed to all our lives in the period following March the 17th, 2020. And the unprecedented demands that that placed on us as individuals and on institutions likewise I think we are all familiar with the idea that having transitioned to virtual learning in its various forms, that there were issues arose that we really hadn't thought about. For example, the issue of working at home with a, a, a class of students. Um, you had other individuals, other adults in the home trying to work in the same way as yourself. You had perhaps children running around your feet. Students themselves had these same kind of issues with other partners in their homes or children. Um, so all of a sudden we were faced with a, a set of challenges that were unprecedented. And those initial weeks were, they were rather chaotic as people moved to, for, I think in the first instance, I had a lot of students telling me that they were just being directed to the VLE. Go and read my stuff on the VLE and here's a, an email from the tutor that will help you. And then that transition to saying, well, wait a minute, um, I, why don't you listen to my live lecture for 30 minutes or an hour on your laptop? and realizing that that really wasn't a fit for purpose way of delivering um, learning and teaching. And then thinking about how do we get social presence when we are working in a virtual environment? And then how do we promote collaborative working and make the students feel that they're part of something rather than just uh, uh, looking at uh, a talking head on a screen? So these are all the challenges that, that were faced by colleges. And I think the, the thing to say up front is that you know, colleges did rise to the challenge, but I suppose they all rose to the challenge in their own way. It depended on what kind of platforms they had. It depended on the extent to which there were learning technology experts in the college and the extent to which there had been any development of training 
and support for staff and students. And so I think I, I want to make mention at this point of, of um, this series of webinars, um, or sem I've called them seminars there, but I suppose they were a cross between a seminar and a webinar. Um, but I think that idea of moving from the chaos and uncertainty of those first few weeks of April and May in, in 2020 over to having some feeling of control of knowing what staff and students knowing what they were doing and how they ought to do it. I think those virtual bridge, bridge sessions were, to my mind, they were really very important because they were showing how individual lecturers and institutions were moving to a way of coping and managing the, these new contexts. So when I started to think about digital frameworks, uh, I thought, well, OK, um, let me see what colleges have said about this in their own documentation. So the first thing I, I looked at were the outcome agreements that were published in 2019-20, before COVID, because the 2021 cycle of outcome agreements was, was um, cancelled because of COVID. So these are the most recent statements that colleges make. Now, I don't want you to read them all because I only want to pick out the ones that are highlighted. And you'll notice how general they are. We want students and staff to thrive in a digital strategy or to, we're going to focus on digitally enhancing the student experience, making students digitally fluent, a progressive digital skills culture and so on. My favorite one is the last one that staff are to be certified as digital. <laughs> I smiled at that. And what the feeling you get at the end of it is, what, what do these statements mean? Do they actually, what do they convey? Do they give me any sense that these colleges have taken those statements and translated them into something that was more operational, more, more in the way of their implementation plan? Well, of course they had. Most colleges have written along with those general statements of intent, they have written some strategies that we might think of as digital strategies. For some of them, it was part of an IT or an ICT strategy. For others, their digital strategy was part of their learning and teaching. And for some, such as Fourth Valley College, it was a standalone digital strategy. And so I've, I've, I've shown some of the various titles there. But the interesting thing is that not, it's not apparent from all of the college websites whether or not they have such a strategy in place. Now, I want to mention the other things that are running in the background. When the new professional standards for lecturers was published, there was quite a number of references to digital there. And I, I, I don't, be careful what I say, but they suffered somewhat from the same issue I've identified with the outcome agreements. They are couched in very general terms, and sometimes it's hard to know exactly what, what do we mean when we say that um, a, a member of the teaching profession, the lecturing profession, and Scotland's colleges should be able to select appropriate digital approaches. What does that, that actually mean? And another context for the work that we're going to do in, in CDN is, of course, the joint publication between JISC CDN and Scotland's colleges which was called our digital ambition. And our digital ambition is a very important document for the sector because it, it does set out in, in a, a more detailed form what the ambitions and goals are 
for the use of digital in learning. So if you were to ask the question, um, so where are we? What does it look like? Um, what are the competencies that students and staff have in, in Scotland's colleges? Well, I had to reach pretty far back into my archive for that. And Jason will smile when I mention the Etna survey, which I think Jason was published last in 2012 or 13. I think those were the last ones. So since then, we really haven't had <clears throat> any definite indication um, from, from across the nation of where we stand in relation to digital skills and competencies. However, the Education and Training Foundation has published in 2019 uh, these two surveys, one for learner digital perspectives and one for teachers. And they are intended to be UK wide, but again, it's not really addressing where we are in Scotland. That brings us to a question also, thinking back to those statements I drew from the outcome agreements, people spoke about digital in different terms. And, and I think that's always been a question about digital capability. There have always been debates about, is it media literacy? Is it information literacy? You know, what, what are we talking about when we say digital capability? And what sort of dimensions are there in digital capability? And also lots of debates about what kind of definitions would we have for digital capability? And I think most people accept that the definition that was produced by JISC and has since been modified I think that last bit about ever evolving is, is, is the most recent addition to that definition. But you'll see again that that definition of digital capability is, is, is addressed to everyone. It's someone for living, learning and working in the digital society. So that this definition actually applies to every person Now, that's going to lead me on to talk about very briefly about the UK government's publication in April 2019 of a national standard of what they called essential digital skills. And following on that, um, there has been a number of, of publications um, of, oh, sorry, people have created certification around those skills. And you think, well, that might form a standard for us to use within the further and higher education sector. But they're actually very basic. It really is, when they say essential, they mean basic digital skills. The triangle there is a, <clears throat> a, a framework produced by an organization called Digital Work Research. And that was an attempt to look at what does digital capability look like in the workplace? And they expanded those four um, dimensions into a, a set of, of a detailed statements or rubrics. So the reason I'm mentioning these is that, you know, if digital capability is defined as for living, working and being in a digital society, then you know, why wouldn't any of those frameworks um, suffice? And the answer is because they, they are missing out all of the, the important components that are required for digital in a teaching and learning context. Issues to do with, um, well, primarily pedagogy, I would say. Um, so this next slide, shows that some work that was published recently by, um, I'll give you a reference to that um, later on, 
this was a survey of all teacher education digital skills frameworks that were current in the UK in 2020. And you'll see that there's quite a range of them. I'm not going to explain what they all are, but these are all frameworks that describe in some way the competencies that are, are relevant for someone training to be a teacher. And what the way in, ways in which they differ are two dimensions. One, are they focused on the individual or are they focused on the institution? And the second dimension is, are they focused on technical skills or are they focused on pedagogy? Um, so these are the things which distinguish them. And what Falun did was he distilled some of that into a new teacher digital competence framework that was published in, in the, that paper. And you'll see again, it's got dimensions, personal on the left, personal professional on the right. It's got um, technical competence down here, pedagogy here. Um, and then it's got how we're using technology to actually deliver teaching and learning. I'm going to refer to this report because it's got a very useful section where it reviews all of those particular frameworks. And it's trying to sort out which of these frameworks would help us in Ireland uh, produce our own framework. And of course, there's no surprise that the one that that they, they see as being of the greatest significance is the Digital Capabilities Framework published by JISC in 2014 and updated, I think, a year later, 2015, to show these six areas of proficiency. So that ought to be familiar to most people in Scotland because CDN actually used a, a modified version of that um, in some of their work. I think possibly Kenji uh, was responsible for that. But it's interesting, if you look at the language here, I talked about terminology a moment ago. So if we look at information, data, and media literacies is one of the, comp the dimensions of capability here. And when I look at the Irish one, it's called um, find and use. <laughs> um, although I, mu I must say I quite like this, um, this uh, uh, tube network approach to presenting the um, framework for skills. Then, sorry, I've jumped too far ahead. The question then comes up about, well, these are all about You've talked about higher education frameworks. What about further education? Well, actually, the JISC framework covers both further and higher education. But there is a framework that was developed. And you'll notice again, there's the JISC's name coming in here in collaboration with JISC, Education and Training Foundation, adapted that for this framework, which has got you'll notice seven dimensions. And for each of those dimensions, there are three stages. There's exploring, adapting, and leading. Or is that, yes, adapting and leading. Um, and another one produced for the Welsh government, and once again, in collaboration with JISC. So you'll see that that JISC framework has, has had a very significant influence on the way that other people, whether it was in, in Ireland or in Wales or for the Association of Colleges in England, um, they, they've said that that serves the purpose very well for us. So that's the kind of where I got to, I thought, these are the frameworks that were in, in existence before COVID arrived on the scene. So these were the, the statements of capability that were going to inform what we were doing 
and how we were implementing our digital strategies. So the research proposal that uh, Kenji has been talking about is that if that's the case, if they all have taken their cue from that JISC capability framework, to what extent do these frameworks serve the needs of the sector? And how might they be developed to reflect the current and possible future demands? So those are the kind of questions that we want to explore in, in this research. So um, this is a question for those who have joined us from colleges today. Um, that's a very brief overview of digital capability frameworks. But thinking about your experience now over the last 12 months, what digital capabilities are required of you or your colleagues that are not represented in this framework? So the second question I'll come to in a moment, but maybe just answer that one. So what, what do you think from your experience is not sufficiently represented in that framework? And I'll stop sharing and come out to the chat room, see what's in here. Hi there. Hi, Russell. Uh, I was actually, I joined a bit late. Uh, it was 20 past 11 before, before I got on. I was on a, I was on a previous call. Um, but from what I picked up on, you know, getting over the frameworks that you were showing there, um, you know, something that we did post-COVID at Ayrshire College was to try and streamline and simplify things a lot. So I, I would say that the framework, what it covers is probably, you know, there's nothing really that isn't covered from, from our point of view, I don't think. I can think of off the top of my head, as I say, I missed the beginning. Um, so I don't know if, you, if you're referring to the JISC framework or the other yeah. frameworks that I saw since uh, joining, <clears throat> then, you know, it's, it's, it's doing a lot of good. Yes, what I wanted to kind of show Russell was that <clears throat> these frameworks have developed. I mean, the set of frameworks that that that, that uh, Falun refers to in his paper are all post 2010. You know, so there's been a whole range of frameworks produced, and I just wanted to show that the the, the kind of people have kind of settled now on the just capability framework. As, as being the one that is, 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 the, is, the, is the key reference point for most current yeah. developments. Yeah, and certainly we were using the, you know, we launched the JISC <clears throat> capability tool back in October. So we've been kind of, you know, utilizing okay. that as well as a kind of marker in the sand amongst our own kind of internal course templates, course checklists, mm -hmm. blended learning sort of training that, you know, the kind of basics that we wanted staff to to get to grips with, you know, be it the technology side of things like teams and stuff or pedagogical things like simple, mm -hmm. simple examples of asynchronous versus synchronous and active yeah. and passive, trying to get lectures to think in that, in that way. So, okay. uh, Walter, uh, Emma has added into the chat that she's pointed out that the accessibility and inclusive materials, um, yeah. the need for those and areas. Obviously, the legislation that's been introduced recently does have an impact on that, but perhaps that, that's another element. Well, th thank you for those. And I'm going to ask you now to, um, to think about the second one. So, so that, that in a way, Emma, Emma has answered the second question rather than the first one. <laughs> You know, what, what aspects of remote or virtual learning are not sufficiently represented? At least I'm early for something. Yes. <laughs> Walter, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that the majority of colleges had never really assumed that they would be delivering remotely. So in, in those frameworks, the, the notion of using Zoom or Teams, that the idea of synchronous delivery through a, a remote medium yeah. is, is not one that's really been 
addressed, I suppose. Yeah. But equally, you are right that the majority of frameworks that exist don't really go down to the level of detail as to the specific skill that's required. It's, it's mm -hmm. generally a, a generic statement. But I, I noticed in some of the work at Ayrshire, Russell might be able to sort of chip in here around, they've done a lot more around picking out very specific concrete skills and examples when they're, they're trying to evaluate staff ability. Yeah. Kenji, can we come to that in the discussion afterwards? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, because um, I think the 30 minutes is about to yes, you, expire. You, you have five minutes yeah. left. <laughs> yeah. So, so my, my thoughts were, just as you've said, about this whole idea of managing groups, you know, because I, I suppose teachers, teaching staff never had to do that before, manage a group in a virtual collaborative context. context. And so people all of a sudden found that they were having to allocate students to, to groups using Teams or, or Zoom breakout rooms or whatever. All of a sudden assessment, the only way of doing it was online. And I think that was a huge challenge um, for many. And then what Emma's talked about is accessibility and inclusion. And I think all of a sudden, staff were having to become much more aware of, of the, whether there were any signs of students struggling with their mental health and well-being. They were you know, stopping um, attending or not turning on their camera or you know, they were now looking for different kind of signs or signals in, in, in their groups. And what I think is a, a real biggie is learning design. So I don't find much in the capability framework that addresses those, those kind of challenges about assessment being online and no other way of doing it, uh, about caring for students and about thinking about learning design and how does learning design support the, these new modes of delivery. So I'm just going to move on quickly <clears throat> to say that what we're going to do in this research is we're going to get collect the digital strategies from the colleges and do some analysis of them. We're going to interview a senior manager in each, in each college. Then we're going to collate <clears throat> that information and then triangulate with known sector leading digital initiatives in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So, and finally, we'll gather together some focus groups to discuss the conclusions and findings. So where are these known sector leading digital initiatives? And that's where I come back to this report. Shaping the Digital Future of FE and Skills is an ongoing project, Jason, at JISC. Uh, that is a report of phase one, and it contains some really good examples of current practice post-COVID. And I presume, Jason, if you want to add anything, that um, you will be pursuing some of those in more detail. Indeed, we will be. And uh, there are some deep dives going on with regards to digital pedagogy and other areas and uh, taking forward the digital elevation model as well. Yeah, great. So uh, I see that as being very valuable to the work that we're going to do at CDN. <clears throat> so if you want to make a contribution to this study or give me your thoughts, I'd be very glad to hear from you. And Walter, as always, you have timed excellently to the last minute there <laughs> of our presentation. So that brings us um, to an end uh, for this virtual bridge session. But obviously, if, if you would like to get in touch with Walter um, and contribute to the work that's being done here, um, by all means, please do reach out. And if you are available for a future virtual bridge session, then I hope to see you here in this virtual room. But until then, yeah. Take care and stay safe.